Hello everyone and welcome to another MTG Top 10. I'm Nitsa Hone and I bring you guys one of these each and every Friday. This week we're looking at cards that have a special place in my heart, those which blow up lands. About 12 years ago I went through a phase where all I did was play land destruction decks. Yeah, I was that guy. In standard I played Eminent Domain and in extended I was playing a red-green wildfire deck. Land destruction can be a powerful strategy, as mana is necessary for your opponent to cast spells and if your opponent doesn't have enough mana to cast spells, they're just going to lose the game. These days, Wizards tries to dial back how good land destruction cards are because it results in such an unfun experience for people who play against it. This means that not very many recent cards are on this list. To qualify for this list, the cards on it had to result in the destruction of your opponent's lands. This can include cards that force your opponent to sacrifice lands. I chose not to include color hosing land destruction spells because it didn't seem really like pure land destruction to me because it can only destroy one basic land type and they felt too narrow. I did, however, include land destruction that can only target non-basic lands, as these are pretty ubiquitous. Before we get to number 10, let me give you a quick reminder on how I score cards on these lists. Cards receive points depending on how many Grand Prix or Pro Tour Top 8s they have received, with a Pro Tour Top 8 worth twice as much as a Grand Prix Top 8. The cards in this list are then arranged numbers 10 through 1, with the highest score being found at number 1. I consider Legacy and Vintage Championship events as Pro Tour Top 8s, as those are the highest level of competition in those formats. In the description, you can find land destruction cards with five or more points who didn't quite make this list. Before I get started, try your hand at guessing the number one card in this list in the comments. Now, on to number 10. At number 10, we have Goblin Ruin Blaster. Nothing special in terms of stats as a 2-1 with haste for three mana, the Ruin Blaster saw play because of the format he existed in. In the standard of his time, most decks were three or more colors and ran a ton of non-basic lands, including powerful man lands. The Ruin Blaster was a good card to have out of your sideboard, with some aggro decks even running a full four of them in the main board. Turns out that if you are blowing up your opponent's win condition like a Celestial Colonnade, a 2-1 body isn't too bad. He never saw play outside of standard, but for two years this guy blew up a lot of lands there. At number 9 we have Sundering Titan. This guy brings a huge body with him that is also capable of nuking up to 5 lands when he comes into play and 5 when he leaves play. In a world where lands have more than one land type, this isn't too hard to do. Sometimes you will take a land or two of yours with him, but usually you can take down more of your opponents since you get to choose the targets. Especially because the deck where the Titan has seen the most success is in decks running the Tron lands, who could quickly ramp into him, and which are generally decks that run very few basic lands, so it is usually going to be a pretty one-sided effect. In Standard, Tron wasn't around though, and he only picked up one Pro Tour Top 8 in the sideboard of an Astral Slide deck, but that deck could do some truly heinous things with him since it could flicker him over and over again, destroying 10 lands basically each time. In Extended though, where he could be cast with the Tron lands, he put up most of his numbers in blue-white and blue-green Tron decks, which were, for a time, pretty dominant. After Extended ended in 2011, he continued to see play for a while in Tron decks, picking up two Grand Prix Top 8s in them, but eventually they turned towards casting different huge monsters. In 2014, he even managed a Top 8 in Legacy in a Mud deck. What he does is so powerful that he even sees play in Vintage, having Top 8 at the Vintage Championships in 2014, and just missing out on a Top 8 in 2015's Vintage Championship. He hasn't seen play in a while, but he could show up again. At number 8 we have Stone Rain, which is one of the original land destruction spells printed back in Magic's first set, Alpha. It is a simple card, simply blowing up lands for 3 mana. We never get land destruction this cheap anymore. It has been reprinted numerous times in Ice Age and Tempest and 6th edition and Mercadian Masks and 7th, 8th, and 9th editions and in Champions of Kamigawa most recently, which has given it multiple rides through standard and block formats. It has picked up two top eights in block formats, but in two different formats. One in a four-color control deck at Pro Tour Columbus in 1996, which was an Ice Age block Pro Tour, and the other in a Red Deck Wind style deck at Pro Tour Los Angeles in 1998, a Tempest block Pro Tour. And Standard have picked up its first Pro Tour Top 8 at World in 1995 in a mono-red aggro burn deck. Once it was reprinted in Mercadian Mass, it helped spawn a mono-red land destruction deck in Standard, which picked up two Pro Tour Top 8s at World in 1999 and one in 2000. Since then, it has seen play in Psychotog decks, Goblin decks, Red Aggro, Blue Red Ponza, Gruel Aggro, and Boris Aggro decks in various different formats. In Extended, it managed one Grand Prix Top 8 and another Red Deck Wins deck, and in Modern, it has picked up two Grand Prix Top 8s, both in Tron decks. It hasn't managed a Top 8 in any format since 2014, though, and another card that we'll get to later on on this list has replaced it as the Land Destruction spell of choice in Modern. 
At number seven, we have an invitational card, Avalanche Riders. If you don't know, Wizards used to have a tournament that if you won, you got to design a card and your likeness was used for it. Other examples of this include Rangers of Eos, Solemn Simulacrum, and Snapcaster Mage. This one was designed by Darwin Castle, and it is a sweet one. For four mana, you get a 2-2 with haste that blows up a land. He does have Echo, meaning you have to pay four for him again, but four mana for a 2-2 that either did two damage or chump block something, or even better, traded for something, was a pretty great deal, even if you didn't pay the Echo cost. He benefits, too, from being a time-shifted card in Time Spiral, making him legal in Modern and giving him another chance in Modern. In Block, he was a heavily played card, picking up three Pro Tour Top 8s in that format. This is because there were absurdly powerful lands in Urza's Block, like Tolarian Academy, and taking these lands away was a pretty big deal. His second time through Block, there were lots of greedy mana bases, so he saw play again, picking up four Pro Tour Top 8s in Time Spiral Block. In Standard, he saw play primarily in decks built around land destruction, three of which finished in the Top 8 of Worlds in 1999 and two at Worlds in 2000. He's even seen some play in Modern in decks that can toolbox him into play as a way to deal with problem lands like Celestial Colonnade or the Tron lands. This means he has seen play in decks running Birthing Pod and Court of Calling. He has also recently seen some play in Living In decks since he can blow up a land, go to the graveyard, and then come back and blow up another land. At number 6 we have a Planeswalker, a Johnny Vengeant. While a Johnny can do a whole lot of things that aren't blowing up lands, his ultimate has won a lot of games of Magic since it offers a one-sided Armageddon. It is usually pretty hard for your opponent to come back from something like that. He saw a good amount of play in Standard, some in red-white Kithkin aggro decks, others in eponymously named red-white Vengeance decks, and in a whole lot of Naya aggro decks. He also made the transition to Modern, showing up in a lot of mid-range and control decks like Jun, Mardu, Blue-White Control, and most recently in Jeskai and Nahiri control decks, with the top 8 as recently as February of 2017. And control decks is where he most frequently managed to use his ultimate to end the game. He also has one Legacy Grand Prix in a Stoneblade deck from back in 2015. However, he still sees play in Modern and should continue to build his resume. At number 5, we have what is probably the most iconic and powerful of all land destruction spells in Magic, and that is Armageddon, which is as old as Magic is itself. The ideal thing to do was to play your large threat and then cast Armageddon so your opponent couldn't do anything about it because they had no mana, but you had a better board position. This made it ideal for control decks who could make sure the opponent couldn't keep a big creature in play and then blow up all the lands once their threat got into play. This was an effective strategy in the early days of Magic, with Armageddon being a central part of the strategy of decks that top aided Worlds in 1994 and in 1995, both of which were control decks. By 1996, this strategy had evolved into what was famously known as the Urnum Geddon deck. The ideal sequence for these decks was to play Urnum Jin and then play an Armageddon. For the time, Urnum Jin was an amazingly aggressive creature as a 4 mana 4 5. He came with one downside you had to give one of your opponent's creatures Forest Walk every turn. Well, if you played your Jin one turn and Armageddon the next, you no longer had lands, so the downside was no longer relevant because your opponent could not make your lands into, uh, could not make their creatures unblockable because you had no forests. So the downside was no longer relevant, and you almost certainly had the largest creature on the table. Other decks would play Armageddon over the years, most of them following the same model, just playing a different creature than Urnum Jin, and all in all, Armageddon got 10 standard Pro Tour Top 8s. It also did some work in Extended, picking up 4 Pro Tour Top 8s and 2 Grand Prix Top 8s in a variety of aggro and control decks that all aim to, of course, put themselves in the best board position and then nuke everyone's lands. And Legacy has picked up multiple Grand Prix Top 8s as well, following more or less the same strategy. Despite all its power, Armageddon hasn't seen play in Legacy since 2010, and it seems unlikely to improve its resume. At number 4, we have the card that usurps Stone Rain as the land destruction spell of choice in Modern. This is because it doesn't provide you with as much of a tempo hit if you cast it in your red deck. Usually you're going to be able to do 2 damage in addition to slowing your opponent down, and that additional upside just makes this way better than Stone Rain, which means you're tapping out to destroy a land and not building your board or doing damage to your opponent at all. Molten Rain gets around that. Because of the prevalence of Tron decks and other non-basic lands in Modern, Molten Rain shows up in a lot of sideboards and even some mainboards. Before we get to talking about Modern, though, let's talk about Molten Rain in Block and in Standard. In Block, it picked up three Pro Tour Top 8s at Pro Tour Kobe in 2004, all in Mono Red Control decks. Rain was a good card because of the presence of 12 posts, which ran very similar to Tron decks, and it didn't hurt that Blink Moth Nexus and Artifact lands were everywhere either. In Standard, it saw a little bit less play, but it was played alongside Stone Rain in Mono Red Land Destruction decks of the time, and also picked up a Grand Prix Top 8 in a Goblin deck sideboard. But Modern, as I've already indicated, is where Molten Rain has really shined as an important sideboard card in any deck that can cast it. This has included Burn decks, Grixis, Control, Rug Delver, and more. It still sees play in Modern to this day. 
At number three, we have Acidic Slime, who can blow up a lot more than just lands and who has Death Touch, making it basically always a two for one. It was originally printed in Magic 2010. It was reprinted in Magic 2011, Magic 2012, and Magic 2013, giving it a lot of time in Standard. Because of the Ooze's flexibility, he saw a ton of play in Standard, and that's where it has all of its points. While it seems a bit like a sideboard card, the fact that it can blow up three different kinds of permanents and will basically always blow something up, it actually meant it saw a lot of mainboard play, which it did in Genesis Wave decks, Rug Control, Ramp decks, Green White Aggro, Birthing Pod decks, and Kessig Titan decks. Its most impressive showing was probably at Pro Tour Dark Ascension, where it picked up four top eights, one in a Birthing Pod deck, and the other three in Kessig Titan. As long as this was in standard, it found its way into decks. It is unlikely that it adds to its score, unless it gets yet another reprint, then I think it is a fairly safe bet to see play in standard once more. At number two, we have Fulminator Mage. Kind of a descendant of Avalanche Riders, the mage is a 2-2 creature that can blow up a land. Though they do have to be non-basic, the majority of decks in the formats it sees play in basically always have a non-basic land in play, so it is basically a stone rain that can block an attack, and that's pretty good. It didn't actually do much in the standard of its time, picking up only one Grand Prix Top 8 in 2009, and it also picked up only one Grand Prix Top 8 and extended in, 20, in 2010 in Travis Wu's Living In deck, where, similar to how it works with Avalanche Riders, you basically got to blow up two of your opponent's lands with a single Fulminator Mage. Modern is where it has done the most work, though, as there are non-basic lands everywhere. It first debuted in the format in Birthing Pod decks and has seen play in the modern version of Living In, but has seen the most play in Jund. More recently, has seen a bit of play in decks packing Collected Company, as it's a pretty good card to hit off of your Collected Company, and it has recently shown up in the sideboard of Death Shadow Zoo decks. It will only build on its lead on the other cards on this list, since it still sees such consistent play in Modern. Even just so far in 2017, the Mage has added 12 points to its score. Still, that wasn't enough to claim the number one spot on this list, so let's see what that is. Well, the number one card overall is Wasteland, but there are actually three cards with more points than Fulminator Mage, and another card that comes just behind it. They are all lands that destroy other lands, and I decided to include them all at number one here so that this list could include some more diverse cards from Magic's history. However, all four of these cards have done a lot of work in various formats. Wasteland sees play in Eternal formats and is pretty much a staple since Strip Mine, which you can also see here, is restricted in Legacy and Vintage. Otherwise, it's likely it would be number one on this list. Tectonic Edge saw play in both Standard and in Modern, and Ghost Quarter has as well, in addition to seeing a bit of play in Eternal formats. All of these lands are great, because they allow you to attack your opponent's mana base, no matter what color you are playing, and without having to actually include a spell in your deck. These lands all produce mana for a while before you blow up your opponent's lands. I won't bore you by talking about all of the different decks that run these lands, as the fact that they are colorless has led to them being played in a multitude of decks. They can be sideboarded against decks like Tron or any other deck reliant on non-basic lands or basic lands in the case of strip mine. That does it for this week's MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. If you have any suggestions for a future Top 10, let me know in the comments below. And if you want to make sure you catch more Top 10s like this one, don't forget to subscribe. You can also find more of my Top 10s over on another channel called the Ether Hub that you should definitely check out. My content is sponsored in part by FiveColorCombo.com, a great website for all things magic. You can use my discount code NEETSAHONE5 to get a 5% discount in their store. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.